The United States, as a new nation, expanded westward. Rivers with rapids, trails with stumps, and unexplored areas posed hazards for the early settlers. Several leaders suggested the advantages of a new water route to the west, a canal. After much study and a scare created by the British in Canada, permission was won to start the Grand Canal. Digging was followed by water, water by use, and use by settlement. As ports on the Great Horse Ocean, towns grew up, served by and serving the men on the ditch. Begun in 1817, the chief engineer of Rome was the first boat to travel the Erie two years later in 1819. First commercial traffic was handled in 1820 between Montezuma on the Seneca River through Syracuse to Utica and the Mohawk River. By 1823, the Erie was opened to Albany, and two years later, 1825, the project was completed, Buffalo to Albany to New York by boat. Ceremonies everywhere were concluded by the marriage of the waters in New York Harbor, the symbolic mixing of Lake Erie water with the Atlantic Ocean. At last, the inland seas of America were linked to all the waters of the world. Columbia ruled the world that day. Visitors from Europe took the fashionable tour to the West, boat up the Hudson, rail to Schenectady, pack it to Utica, buggy to Trenton Falls, stage to Niagara, lake boat to Ohio, and then finally back to New York City and home. The canal portion of the trip was not without its hazards. Low Bridge was a cry respected by the passengers sitting on luggage on top of a sleek packet boat. It was either duck or take a bath. The captain was an important person, at least in his own opinion. Food was served family style on trestle tables. Beds were assigned by lot or in the order of signing on for passage. Three deep, five and a half feet long, 18 inches wide, they were more like bookshelves than beds. Men and women were separated by red velvet drapes, but nothing relieved the heat, noise, odors, or the mosquitoes. Still, it was the fastest, best, and smoothest way to travel in the United States. Cargo, rather than passengers, provided the backbone of canal use. 267 items on the toll list were checked waylocks across the state. Most raw foods moved east, with import and specialty manufactured items going west. Slow boats, a mile and a half or two miles an hour, moved from Albany to Buffalo in nine days. Through locks, past towns, across aqueducts, over culverts, by feeders. The cargo boats themselves looked like floating shoeboxes. Men on the canal early learned that they could carry more cargo in boats of that design than anything else. Three types of boats with variations were commonly used. The scow, one of the low-priced three in today's automobile talk, the laker, the moderate-priced model, and the bullhead, the top of the line. Built at boat yards along the canal, each proudly carried its maker's name. Repairs, if they were necessary, were made at dry docks along the line. Ranging from $1,000 to $5,000 in value, the boats had a life expectancy of about 15 years. Carrying grain or lumber first, uh, lumber when the boat began to get leaky and cranky, after all, the boat sank, the cargo would float. And finally, stone or coal, which the canal water that leaked into the old hulk couldn't hurt. After that, the boat was disposed of. Originally operated by a captain with a hired crew, a cook from an agency in one of the canal towns, another steersman, and two hagis or mule drivers, the boat ran 24 hours a day. The crew worked six-hour tricks, six on, six off, six on. But the captains eventually found that family operation of the boat, or boats for he generally operated too, were more efficient and cheaper, or he could use his wife as relief steersman and the children, the yonkers, as mule drivers. They lived as a family in the cabin at the rear of the boat, a room possibly 14 by 16, 
the stove, chairs, tables, beds, and everything else crammed in. But it was efficient, just as house trailers today are efficient. The team that provided power for the boat had its own cabin, or the stable, at the front end of the boat. There, three mules, or horses, it depended on the preference of the captain, would rest for six-hour trick, while three others pulled the boat with a 125-foot tow rope attached to a cleat a third of the way back on the boat. The tow rope was never attached to the bow, for if it was in the middle of the front of the boat, it would pull the boat constantly into the tow path. After six hours, the boat would stop, a horse bridge was pulled across the towpath, and the rested team changed places with the tired team. As demand for cargo capacity grew, the state enlarged the canal from 40 feet wide and 4 feet deep to 70 feet wide and 7 feet deep. Boat capacity increased, too, from 76 tons on Clinton's Ditch to 240 tons on the enlarged Erie. Always improving the system, structures were rebuilt, locks were doubled, and then lengthened. The improvements went on and on. The success of this operation, the Hayburner powered cargo boat, and its impact on communities along the Erie, led to a new phenomenon. Canals to serve the hinterland, lateral canals, mostly of the dimensions of the original Erie, were approved by the state legislature. Despite the good intentions of the lawmakers, these little ditches did not succeed. They went up hillsides into areas where little cargo was available for shipment. Railroads were more efficient in those areas. Insufficient state funds were available for maintenance. The smaller dimensions of the lateral canals demanded smaller boats to carry the cargo out, and anything coming in had to be transferred at the junction point on the old Erie. They were good ideas, but they failed and were abandoned in 1878. Steam power for canal boats was encouraged by a state-sponsored contest. Although only a moderate success resulted for cargo boats, steam packets and private craft used the canal increasingly. Railroad competition bid into canal shipping, though leading the state of New York to abolish tolls in 1883. The American demand for speed and transportation for goods as well as passengers led the residents of New York to approve construction of the barge canal system in 1903. In use partially by 1910, formal completion was declared in 1918. New types of barges combined with the old style boats to give good service. But changes continued, and today 3,000 ton barges and private pleasure craft vie for space on the ditch. For New York Staters, the Erie Canal was many things. The first state financed internal improvement in America. A model for canal construction in other states. The father of the canal era in American history. A way west for immigrants moving to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and on. It was a stimulus to town growth, for Utica, Canastota, Syracuse, Port Byron, Rochester, and a myriad of other towns. But most of all, it was a way of life for Yorkers, for the boaters, hoggies, and boat builders, for the tavern keepers, hardware merchants, and grocery operators, for the engineers, construction gang, and waymasters, for the children along the canal, their parents and their neighbors, for all of these, and for those who wish to see the York state of yesterday in a microcosm. The Erie Canal was a way of life worth examining, with boats, men, cargoes, mules, towns, communication, industry, all these part of a picture that today is seen in the preserved Waylock and in the Erie Canal Park. Thirty miles of hiking, bicycling, boating, camping, fishing, history, scenery, and memory. Memories of the folk of the Empire State about their Grand Canal, known as the Erie.
it's a little bit difficult at times for the small boat, but it's really for a very minor commitment. States to do this. Our estimate is that the state's share of it wouldn't be spent all at once. It would be about six and a half million dollars, which is the cost of two miles of superhighway. And it turns out that, as you all know, in the political process, that those who were organized uh, in the special interest and these people who have been organized before always do better when the budget cutting process begins. But now it's never really had the sort of constituency that I think it has in terms of users and the people who could use it. But it really hasn't had any organized political constituency. So that it's time the budget cutting begins, Canal is always one of the first things to, to go. As someone from the city, one of the things that friends to see is that more and more of us from downstate want to be vacationing and using and enjoying this very unique resource in New York rather than going elsewhere. One of the reasons that my son and I were anxious to have a look at it is that we can talk convincingly about that, not only to my own conviction, but also to people throughout the state. Also, I anxious to have a look at the tremendous work that Johnson and others have done in terms of developing the history of the canal to the museum and what have you. Um, we have also been interested in having a look at the pollution level. I can tell you from the, our initial data, we're conducting oxygen tests as we go along, and sending a sterile sample to Rochester. But the water is really surprisingly good between Rochester and Buffalo. In fact, in most of the areas, there's enough oxygen to support trout. Uh, there's uh, chemical pollution, however. There's also quite clear that the sewage from the small town is going into the canal. Uh, in between the towns, the water really purifies itself significantly. Uh, it gets quite bad in Rochester, and then it improves as you work your way out of Rochester. You can get into the Montezuma Swamp there, why it cleans itself up a good deal, and then it begins to get worse in the Syracuse. My sense is, I'm an outsider, but you really have something fantastic out there. We ought to really be developing it. We ought to be using it. We ought to be convincing people that uh, this is something that ought to be developed. You can hike along the construction say that it's really a very modest thing. The other thing that's impressed me is that throughout the town, there are a very substantial number of people who on their own, without any kind of uh, formal organization, have gone out and developed recreation areas, small park spaces, and what have you, along the canal. The curious thing is that these people don't know each other. There'll be a little group in Brockport, and if they're around 10, 15 miles, there'll be somebody else who's done the same thing. It's clear that one of the things that we've seen is that there ought to be some kind of a canal conference, some sort of an organized effort by which people who are on their own without public support, developing areas in their towns can get together so that they can share information about what funds are available and how this can be done in ways that really meet local areas, the needs of local constituents. Now, we have a representative from the Department of Environmental Conservation here who perhaps could introduce us all to each other. Anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. 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 Oh, I'
stop back there. Bob, my step, I will pick up. So if anybody wants to stay and have a bear with us before we put back in the water, I think we've got enough to see most of them. Yes, sir. Well, well, well.